Good morning, everyone. It's been a while since I've been here. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, you guys all have your Bibles at the Bible study, right? Of course. It's appropriate to have the Bibles at the Bible study. Okay, good. So we're, we just finished a season. Do you guys know what feast we had this week? What was the feast that we celebrated this last week? The Feast of the Cross. What was the beginning of this season? We were celebrating joyfully from what day to the Feast of the Cross? It was earlier this month. What, what did we celebrate? Coptic New Year. What do we celebrate with the Coptic New Year? We celebrate the lives of those who gave their life and shed their blood in the martyrs and preserved the faith for us. And we're joyful all the way. And it ends in the Feast of the Cross. What a glorious season to remember the saints. And so I love this season. And it always reminds me to go back to the saints and there's one passage I always enjoy reading at this time. It's in the book of Hebrews because it talks about a cloud of witnesses and the heroes of faith. Everyone needs to know what chapter is the heroes of faith chapter? Close. Hebrews. Yes, keep going. There's only <laughs> 13 options, not 15. Okay, Hebrews 11. I want you guys to learn certain chapters, like the go-to chapters. You want to read about the heroes of faith? That is chapter 11 in Hebrews. And right after it, in chapter 12, it's very convenient how 12 comes after 11. He says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So I really like to talk about this cloud of witnesses at this time of the year. Why does St. Paul even talk to us about a cloud of witnesses? What is the benefit of looking to... By the way, do you know what the word witness is in Greek? Or what is the Greek word that means witness? It's actually martyr. Martyr actually means witness. So we're surrounded by a great cloud of martyrs or witnesses. People who by their lives were an amazing example. And... I want to ask you, do you have these heroes in your life? Do you have the people that you look at and you say, I want to be like, are you encouraged by them? Why do we read the Synexarian every day? It's the stories of people who gave their life to God and they lived a life to their fullest. We never celebrate their beginning. We always celebrate their end because they were faithful until death. And because of the early church when there were lots of persecutions it was encouraging to the other christians to hear how so and so was faithful how they endured all the sufferings and tortures until their final day and then everyone be like wow we can do this having this cloud of witnesses is supposed to be encouraging so he says i want you to look at this cloud of witnesses who was the book of hebrews written to The Hebrews, excellent, wonderful. Which Hebrews? This is a very awake group. You've had your coffee, I can tell. Um, it was the Hebrews who had just become Christian. So they were Jewish Christian. In the early church, everyone was actually pretty much Christ, Hebrew, Jewish, that became Christian. And this was a problem for a lot of them. A lot of them were being persecuted because the culture was Jewish then when you left the true faith to follow this other teacher, it's almost like you leaving Christianity to go be Muslim. You're like, what? You, you want to kill that person. And so that's actually what was happening. You're one of them now, so they were losing their jobs, their businesses, sometimes their houses were being plundered, they were being ostracized, and they were going through difficult times. Like, I made this decision to follow Jesus, and now I'm wondering if I made the right decision. Should I continue? One of the themes in Hebrews is that the Jewish Christians were very sluggish. We're going to talk about that. They were like, I don't know. They were kind of like a, at a standstill in their lives, and they were not moving forward. So St. Paul gives us Hebrews 11, which is a list of amazing heroes of faith, like Abraham and Moses and Sam, like all these people that did amazing things in the Old Testament. But then he says this part in chapter 12 for us to be encouraged. This is a very encouraging reading. 
And so he's trying to let us look at their examples. He says, since we are surrounded, sorry, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. He says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What is he talking about in this verse? What is he encouraging us to do? Like, what, what does he say that we are doing? He says we're actually running a race. He says we're running a race. And he says, in order for you to run this race, you're going to have to look at the cloud of witnesses. You're going to have to lay aside the weight and the sin which ensnares us. You have to have endurance. He says, we're going to also look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despite the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And I'm going to read the next two verses. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls, which is what they were going through. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And I want to stop there. So I want to talk first about this race. How many of you feel like you're in a race? One of the things they tell you at the beginning of the race where you're racing to. You, if they just say, okay, go start running and we'll tell you when you get there, that's not very fun. You don't know, you're, is it a sprint or is it a long race? So they always need to put, you're racing towards that goal. St. Paul is saying, you're racing towards a goal. What is your goal? Well, St. Paul likes to talk about running and athleticism a lot. In, first, sorry, in Philippians chapter 3, it's back a few books, He's talking about a race and his own race, and it's an example for us. So you look at Philippians chapter 3, I think it's around verse 10. Sorry, in verse 12, he says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. Like I'm moving forward, that I may lay hold on that for which Christ has laid hold on. Of me, I don't count myself to have appreh apprehended. One thing I do, I forget those things which are behind. I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. If you look at St. Paul's life, you can tell he was a man with a mission. He was definitely running in a direction and for a purpose. What direction are you running in? And are you even running? Are you in the race? You're called to be in the race. You're supposed to be in the race. What's your goal? Okay, it's the upward call. What, what is that? Okay, it is, it is the kingdom of heaven. Christ has called us so that he can take us to heaven, but we also have another goal as Orthodox Christians. It's to be united with him in such a way that that union causes you to become like him. Our goal is not just to get to heaven. Our goal is to be united with him and to become like him. So I have a problem is that many of us feel like we're not even running. We don't have a direction. We have many races. You're not looking at the goal. He says, I keep my eyes on the prize. St. Paul says, I keep my eyes on the prize. Are you keeping your eyes on the prize? Well, how often should you be looking at the prize? How often should you be looking at the goal? When was the last time you did? When was the last time you're like, I'm actually moving somewhere? You want to know what the problem was with them? He says, you guys are uh, becoming very sluggish. In a race, it's not good to be sluggish. He also says, you guys are drifting away. What is drift? What drifts? Uh, two things come to mind. Things that drift. A dead fish that goes wherever the water takes it. Or a lazy river. Right? You, wherever you're like in a lazy river, you're doing nothing. Both of those are bad. <laughs> you don't want to be a dead fish. You don't want to be claiming the lazy river where you're lounging and you're going wherever the water is taking you. And the goal might be to go that way, but you're just going and you're not making any effort to go towards the goal. I want to ask you if you were to look at your progress in this race, if you were to look at yourself from the beginning of 2023 till now, would you feel like you're making progress towards the goal? 
Can you look at your spiritual life and say, oh yeah, I'm so much closer. Okay, by age, yes, we're getting closer to the end of the race, but are we getting closer to the goal? Then let me ask you, what about in the last 10 years? Are you that much different spiritually in the last 10 years? For some of you, that's like a quarter of your life. For some of you, that's like 5%. But you know, like it's a quarter of your life in 10 years and you've made hardly any progress? Then I want to ask you, are you racing? Are your eyes on the prize? As a Christian, especially in America, we're very easily distracted. What is the prize? The prize is to get the nice house, to get your kids into college, to get them graduated from college into a job, to get your kids married. We have so many races that we're trying to run that we forget that there's a larger race. We are, and I got to tell you, if you're actually in a race on a track and you, it's like a 400 mile, 400 yard race and you run 200 and you stop and you sit and you, you have lunch, you know, What's going on? Why did you stop? Well, I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. I just wanted, this part of the race was fun for me. This is what I liked, so I'm going to stop here. No, you got to go to the end. Don't get distracted by the things that are on the way. And that's why he says, lay aside the weight, which so easily ensnares you. But before I get to the weight, I really feel like it's important to be goal-oriented. In our spiritual, if you do not have goals at work, what do you accomplish? Nothing. Same thing in life. If you don't have goals, what are your goals? Okay, there is the ultimate goal of getting to heaven and becoming like Christ, but do you have many goals? Do you have like, okay, I'm working on this. During this fast, I'm working on this. I need to try to improve in this situation. I need to work on this sin that's in my life. I'm not able to move. I believe you need to have goals. So if you want to benefit from this passage, you need to have a goal. Stop living life without a goal. Not a, okay, yeah, if someone asks me, yeah, I'm going to heaven. Are you pursuing it? Are you running a race? Or you're just drifting, hoping that the wave takes you in that direction? And how urgent are you? If you were to be given a project at work, and your boss says, you know what, just get it done whenever. If it takes two years, if it takes five years, that's okay. Just, just take your time. Does that ever happen at work? <laughs> no. Why is it that our bosses say, you need to do this now. It needs, by Monday, I need it. And you're like, I will do it. How much time do you have left to run this race of life? How much time left? Some of us have already had 30 years, 40 years, 50, 60. How much time do you have left? And how much time do you need to make progress? We're drifting. We're sluggish. We're actually, some people are actually turning away. What he says is, when you're not encouraged, look at the cloud of witnesses. Look at the cloud of witnesses. And, and we have our favorite saints, you know, St. Damiana, St. George, St. Mina, St. Abu Safain. Like those, like, we love the martyr saints because of what they endured. So does that mean I have to look at martyrs only, who people who like shed their blood? Actually, there's a different spirit of martyrdom. Having the spirit of martyrdom is what matters. Not necessarily dying for Christ in, in, in a violent way, but the spirit. What is the spirit of martyrdom? Is that I'm giving up my life for Christ. That can happen here without bloodshed. It's that same spirit. It's the spirit martyrdom of the will, the martyrdom of the self, where all of a sudden I'm no longer living my life for me, but I'm living my life for him. So how many of us have that spirit? We'll never get to the martyrdom of bloodshed if we don't have the martyrdom of the will and the spirit. Like that's our mentality. And there are certain people who have accomplished this without shedding blood. Abu Nabashwa Kamal is one of my favorite saints. His picture is in our church. And um, he was always disciplining himself. But I love to look to him as a, a witness. almost. And he was the one that talked about the spirit of martyrdom. And he crucified his own will in many ways. He actually lived a celibate life, even though he was married. He did not go after riches, even though he had multiple degrees. Apparently, from what I heard, he used to just sleep on a mattress. He didn't have a bed, he just had a mattress on the floor. 
um, when he was a priest here in LA and you know the church rented him an apartment apparently it didn't have hot water he used to have to heat water in the tea kettle and put it in the bathtub so him and his wife could actually have and he didn't say anything he wasn't like complaining he was just accepting he was just it's not about me and his whole life if you ever read about him or know anyone who knew him his whole life was about serving christ until his last breath he was the example of christ um, many many people will i can tell you stories of this one British lady was on a train with a Buddha Mishoy camel and, and she saw him and she was talking to him and there were like thousands of people because he was going to come to America. And so thousands of people lining the streets and she's like, who is this person? And then after talking to him and being on the train with him for so long, after they left, she's like, he was like Christ. He had accomplished his goal of being united with Christ, like Christ, without having shed blood, but it was that spirit of martyrdom. I'm going to get rid of my selfishness, my pride, my goals. I want to be like Christ. I look at that cloud of great witnesses, that their lives were witnesses to me. I also have the privilege of looking at other witnesses, not people who have died in the past, but people who are near to those dying today. I get to serve persecuted Christians in different countries, like in uh, Nigeria, Syria, Egypt, Iraq. The ones that are closest to my heart are the ones in Nigeria. And when I listen to their stories, nothing encourages me more. So you want to know what is probably one of the most dangerous days to go to church in Nigeria? Christmas. Christmas. There are always tens of people slaughtered on Christmas. All the terrorists know the Christians go to church on Christmas, so they wait for them. You want to know what happens? The Christians still go. Why do we decide not to go to church? There is said there's a 30% chance of sprinkling at 10.30 when I get out of church. I heard the coffee machine isn't so great today, so I don't know if I should go. I, I mean, I was up until 11 p.m., so, I, you know, I don't know. When I look at them, as like, they give their lives. They give their lives. They are so committed. I'm so encouraged by them. Uh, there's a there's a monk in in Lebanon. He's a Catholic monk, amazing man. He he just lives for Christ. He's the strongest Christian I've ever seen. And again, when I look at their stories, he inspires me. So he has this habit of baptizing Muslims. So he he's in a village, and the village is about like 1,100 people, and he baptized like five to 600. So apparently, you're not supposed to do that. Well, apparently, he baptized the sheikh's daughter, and he was not happy. So he sent a group of people, I think there were nine people, to go kidnap him and, you know, cover him. And, you know, he wasn't that scared because it was his third time being kidnapped. And uh, they captured him. And, of course, they're beating him and telling him, you know, you need to stop and leave. He's like, no, I'm moving forward. You can't stop me. And so he, they're, like, beating him. And they said, you know, because your Jesus was, had five wounds, we're going to give you five wounds. So they took a cigarette to each of his legs, like in his bottom of his legs, between the knee and the ankles. Five wounds in each leg to the bone. They said it literally was to the bone. And, um, and he would just get up. Like they, would, like they could not dissuade him from his faith. And so they put him on a barrel. They, t they put him on a barrel, you know, like a round barrel. And they kicked it down the hill. So it was just rolling, rolling, rolling for about 250 meters. And at the end, they untied him. He was fine. And they could not get hit. This man, they could not get the Christ out of him. You know how in Arab, Arabic there's that saying, an dinu? You know, I'm going to take the religion out of him. <laughs> like I'm going to make him change his religion. They couldn't. He was so holding on to Christ. And then in the end, uh, they let him go. And then he recognized two of the people, the two of the kidnappers. They were from his village. So he actually went to go visit them. But he said it took a few weeks, he says, because the wounds in my legs took, were to the bone. He said it took a long time to heal. He still has the scars. And so finally he was able to go back, find those two kids. And he went and said, you guys are my children. I love you. You know, I forget everything. And then a few weeks later, they came back and came back to the church. But you see, there's some people that are not died you know having died in the roman empire there today 
there today. In Nigeria, I talked to people where Boko Haram, you know, is almost like the Nigerian version of ISIS, where they, they're trying to get rid of the Christians in northern Nigeria. So they'll go to the villages, and when they come to your home, they'll ask you, leave your faith or be killed. And this one lady told us, it was me and my husband, and we said, we're not going to leave our faith. Well, Boko Haram doesn't joke around. They come with their swords, they come with their weapons. They, they mean business. And it's not like, well, I want, no, they're going to kill you. Well, they, so when you see them with the swords and they're in your house, there's no way to escape. Leave your faith or we'll kill you. They said, we're not leaving our faith. So they tied the husband's hands and husband's legs and put him on the floor and said, leave your faith. They said, we're not leaving our faith. So they cut off his head. Then they cut his head in half. They put it on his chest. They kidnapped her. She was kidnapped for four days. You can imagine what they were doing to her. Still not willing to leave the faith, she left her kids. She was finally able to escape, grab her kids, run to the bush, and go to a Christian camp. They're that willing to hold on to the faith. The cloud of witnesses is not hundreds of years ago. The cloud of witnesses are today. And they're all over, especially in the Middle East and Africa. There's so much persecution of Christians. And so when we look at the cloud of witnesses, if you look at what St. Paul says at the end of Hebrews 11, he's talking about people from the Old Testament, but it actually is very similar to what is happening today. If you look in verse 32, he says, What more shall I say? For the time would fail for me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson, Jephthah, of David, Samuel, and the prophets. He says, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, they worked righteousness, they obtained promises, they stopped the mouth of lions, they quenched the violence of the fire, they escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, they were valiant in battle, they turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again. He says, but the next part is what I want to focus on. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Meaning they didn't have to be, but they would not accept leaving their faith. Still others, so they didn't, did not accept deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection, which is our hope now. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, which is happening today. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And then he's trying to tell the Hebrews, of whom the world was not worthy. Those are the cream of the crop. Those who endured, who remained faithful to Christ till their last breath. St. Paul says, okay, run your race. Those people are running. They've reached the end. And we're standing still. Our spiritual life, is it progressing? So then he says, if you really want to run well, you have to lay aside the weight or sin that ensnares you. There's different weights and there's different sins, and it's not all just sins. The weights could be different things. The weights could be our the things that consume all our time, where we're not ever get, getting closer to Christ. We're not coming to church consistently, whether it be work, whether it be projects, whether it be like soccer practice, whatever the weight is, family obligations. Sometimes that is what's holding you down. If you were to actually run a race, if let's say any, I'm, I'm 50 years old, any of you guys, if you guys can beat me in a race, I'll give you a million dollars. How many of you are going to come with the diaper bags? How many of you are going to come with those big, you know, scuba fins? You're going to like try to get rid of all the things that would hinder you from running to receive a good prize. Well, we know the prize of the Christian calling is incredible. You wouldn't take those things to a race between me and you. Why are you holding on to certain things that are preventing you from running well towards the kingdom? It's different for all of us. I can't tell you what it is. Every one of us has a different weight, and we have a different sin. There's a verse he says in chapter 12, at verse 4, uh, sorry, verse, was it verse 3. It says this, he says, You have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. He says, a lot of us want to hold on to the weight. Even though we're not making any progress, it's holding us back. We're not moving forward spiritually because of this thing. He says, you haven't resisted to bloodshed against sin. He's like, 
you need to fight sin to the point of death, to the point of shedding blood. Now, it's funny because the people here who were Jewish, becoming Christian, it says you accepted the plundering of your goods and some of you went to prison. But he says you haven't gone to bloodshed. So they suffered, but they haven't gone to bloodshed. Okay, well, how much are we willing to fight sin? I was thinking about reasons why we're not resisting sin. What are the reasons we don't risk sin, resist it? First of all, it feels good. We like it. Fortunately, Christians, so many of us, I mean, the devil has to make the sin pleasurable, otherwise you wouldn't do it. But so many of us are in love with the sins. We don't reject things that we love, even though you know that it's, it's hurting you. One of the reasons we don't resist sins is because we justify them. Like, you know what, I deserve this, I've worked so hard, I went to church, I read my Bible last week, you know, I went to, you know, whatever. I, I can have this one sin, it's okay, right? We justify it, we make excuses for it. Or you say, well, I tried to fight it before and it didn't work, so I'm just going to give in. What happens in a battle when you just give up? You lose, you get slaughtered. And that's the problem with too many of us today is that we're not willing to fight. It's just actually not on our mentality that we're supposed to fight it to the point of bloodshed. Like I, if I were to send you out there, say you were going to fight to save this church and some of you are going to give your lives, like we're going to do whatever we can to protect this church. What are you going to do to protect your salvation? What are you going to do to protect your race? Are we willing? Why won't we fight? Or are we sluggish? Are we on the lazy river? We spend too much time on the lazy river. One of the reasons that we don't resist sin is because we don't see the value of the reward. I would be willing to let go of things at work or certain sins or certain obligations if I understood the reward that I'm racing towards is so much better than anything I could ever achieve here. What matters more? What matters more to us? If you forget the value of the prize, if you take your eyes off of the goal, you make no progress and you don't, you don't work hard at all. Why do people work so hard for the Olympics? They train for four years, day in, day out. They don't get to go to McDonald's and go to all these places that we love to go. They're like, I've got a goal. I've got a target. I'm not letting anything going to hinder me. If you were to get one thing out of today is this. What is hindering you from moving forward? Sometimes we just make excuses. Oh, it's too hard. Really? It's too hard? Anyone about to put you in jail because you own a Bible? Because there's lots of countries where they will. Anyone threatening you on your way to church? No. Anyone preventing you from praying? No. You have to decide what is your weight. You have to get rid of it if you want to make progress. So that's your assignment for today. Lay aside the weight. Now, it's not easy. And not say, oh, okay, I'm going to just get rid of sin and I'm, I'm good tomorrow. No. It's, not, it's a progress and it requires guidance and it requires the work of the Holy Spirit. There's no doubt about it. So we have a goal, which is to run. We have some examples, the cloud of witnesses. We have some advice on laying aside the weight. But then the last thing he says is this. Probably some of the best advice in the whole Bible. He says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Why did Jesus endure the cross? What was the joy? The joy before him was us. But it was also to please the Father, to obey the Father. One of, for those of you who have kids, I know it's probably rare, where you told them to do something and say, Mommy, Daddy, I did exactly what you said. That never happens, right? But the day that it happens, you're like, what? This is like, Jesus Christ said, you gave me a, a plan. You gave me a command. This was your will to go and save these children, our children. And it required me to go on a cross. I'm happy to have done it. One of the joys he had was he could say, your will was done. Does that matter to us as Christians to tell God your will was done? That was his joy. The joy was so much that he would endure the worst tortures ever. If the prize matters to you enough, you're willing to suffer for it. 
for those of you who've gone to high school, gone to college, gone to graduate school, you've worked from the bottom level of work to the top, and all these things you've worked for, you did it because the prize was worth it. But the part I like most about this is he says, look unto Jesus. Whenever you're feeling sluggish, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Abuna Mishwai Kamala, he had a picture, a very simple picture of Jesus Christ on the cross, and at the bottom it said, Min Egli, for my sake. Every day he would stand before the picture of Christ on the cross and say, for my sake. That was his motivation. You know, he had a cancer. Uh, he, had, he died from a cancer, but he considered that was his cross. And he was going to carry it with joy. And people were blessed by him while he was suffering from a cancer. Are we looking to Jesus enough? What happens when we don't look to Jesus? What happened to St. Peter when he was on the water? He stopped looking at Jesus and he sank. If he looks at Jesus, there's, you don't care about anything around. The problem is we don't look to him enough. Do you have a reminder every day? Do you have a picture where you look at him and you say, this is my motivation, this is my goal, this is my prize? When you come to church, what do you see behind the altar? Jesus doing what? Sitting on a throne in heaven, being worshipped by the holy creatures and the 24 priests. All of heaven is honoring and worshipping him. We don't look at that Jesus enough, the glorious Jesus. We forget that one. When you look at the altar, do you see bread? Coming to liturgy is nice, but don't look at bread. Look for Jesus. Everything you do, don't get caught up by the hymns. Or, look for Jesus. The one behind the altar sitting on the throne, the one who's giving himself to you in a humble form of bread, the one who gave everything, his body and his blood. We don't see Jesus enough. Look to Jesus. There's nothing more motivational, more pleasant. When I say look to Jesus, if I were to say look at a picture of your spouse when you first got married, you look at like, ah, your heart just jumps like, wow. Do we have that same thing, that same feeling when we look to Jesus? The crucified Christ, does that give you any, does it mean anything to you? Ah, yeah, Jesus died. But when you look to Jesus, and if he's the one you love, St. Paul says this, he died for all, and if one died, died, sorry, he died, and if one died, he died for all, that we should live no longer for ourselves, but for him who gave himself, died, and rose again. So if St. Paul looks to Jesus and said, he did this for me, I'm willing to run the race to be near him. I'm willing to lay aside the weight for him. I'm willing to run with endurance to reach the goal. I love this time of year because I love the examples of those who fought a good fight, who finished the race, as St. Paul says in 2 Timothy. Um, I pray that we would be encouraged in this time. You know what? Do something difficult. Fight harder, pray more, read more, do matanyas more, come to church more, do whatever you can, but fight sin more. Lay aside the weight, whatever it is, not just the sin, but lay aside the weight. It might just be our mentality. My mentality is I'm good as I am. It's not, that's, that's what's a bad mentality. My mentality is I'm running a race and I'm not there yet, so I need to keep running. Okay? If I give this talk in one year, you better not be in the same place. <laughs> God be with us all. May he give us abundant grace. And maybe, you know what? We're actually, you know what's nice about this? We're running the race together. We're not running against each other, but we're a family. We're a team. We all have one goal. The team wins when we all make it. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. My dear Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loved me and gave himself for me, I thank you so much for your willingness to suffer. You learned obedience through suffering, and you didn't hesitate. You didn't consider the shame. You didn't despise any of it. You actually accepted it. You embraced it because you knew that it would honor your Father. Forgive me, dear Lord, for getting all that you've done for me. Forget, forgive me, O Lord, for taking it for granted and just saying that, yeah, it was a nice thing. Help us all, O Lord, to appreciate the amazing sacrifice you've made. 
Help us to appreciate it to the depth of our soul to realize our lives are worth nothing without it. All our value, all our hope, and all our joy lies in you. You totally are worth it. Help us, O Lord, to accept and see your beauty, to know it personally, to draw forward. But dear Lord, it's a tough race. You know that it is. You know that we don't all like suffering here in America. Help us, O Lord, to accept it anyway. Just as you did for us, help us, O Lord, to do for you. I ask for your grace, your mercy, and your Holy Spirit to work in every one of us. Change us, transform us, that when we see you, we might become like you. The intercession of our dear beloved Mother St. Mary and all the saints who have fought a good fight and finished the race before us, hear us when we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen.